We have to push the button. Um, thank you, everybody. I think we have uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions and discussion. And I do want to emphasize what a good sport Chris is. I, I wanted to show you what a responsible economist looks like. <laughs> <clears throat> so we have a question. Good morning still for two minutes. Um, I'm Faye Bressler. I am board certified in occupational medicine. I've worked with the acronym SOUP of federal government, currently with DOD. Um, this is an incredibly multidisciplinary group here, and I would like to challenge everyone to add two more groups, um, or, or two more groups of people, um, and that is unions, especially in a workplace to engage um, and include unions in your discussions as early as possible. If you don't, you might find pushback um, on various issues and you might find hurdles that could have been dealt with a little bit earlier. The other one, especially for the design side of the folks who are here, is to include people with disabilities. I think walking and stairs are phenomenal but for some people, that's a barrier. So think about how somebody who uses a wheelchair can become fit, how they can become engaged. And it's, it's something I'm trying to tackle right now, trying to get our fitness center to offer some seated aerobic exercises. Even for people who are mobile, that might be a way for them to enter into being more active. So just keep that in mind. Great ideas from everybody. Thank you. Hi, so I'm, I'm curious about how we can better measure or quantify things that we don't yet understand and r risks that we, we don't, where science doesn't even the answer. So for example, there was discussion earlier of endocrine disruptors. It's not, it's, it's not a dose response relationship where it's easy to quantify the risk. Um, and how can we start thinking about risk? I often think that when, when decisions get made, we think about risk in terms of risk of legal liability rather than risk of potential negative health outcome. I guess um, I'll, as the non-doctor, I'll dive in. Um, <clears throat> well, I think, I think the thing that <clears throat> we need to get the idea across that there are human health baselines that can be established through research that don't require a lot of discussion that should lead to design choices that avoid the question uh, altogether. And uh, I think I'd like to think about, you know, we, people talk about putting labels on buildings, sort of like the food product. But one thing I've, I've learned, not only I'm an expert in economics, but since I've joined Health and Human Services, I know all about health. And uh, one of the, uh, things that has impressed me is the informed consent process. And before you experiment on human subjects, you have to explain to them what, what you're going to be doing, what the outcomes might be, what positive, negative effects, uh, be, and you get their permission. Well, I think if designers got the permission of the people who occupy their buildings, inform them of all these possible outcomes, it would change the way designers think, it would change the way they talk to the, the manufacturers and suppliers, because I don't think, I'm pretty sure no one is doing this on purpose. And I think that the whole ideas of green chemistry, is you take a step back and you say, um, in general, endocrine disruptors are bad, except when you're dealing with, you know, like maybe rodents or something. Well, maybe not. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that we can begin to go down the list and say, well, I don't want these things in my building for starters. And then afterwards, I think, I think you know, Chris began to address the incredible complexity of the remaining factors, the, the things that have to do with real design questions. I don't think uh, you know, putting poison in a building is a design question. So. Well, why don't you start as a doctor? <laughs> I, I would like to add to what I think. <laughs> OK. Um, no, um, I, actually, I'm, I, my response, and actually Anthony and I were talking about this last night, um, I, there's many answers to that question, but I think one of them, as we discussed, was this idea that I think we m probably should not presuppose what all the health out impacts will be, but that we still can um, do a pretty good job of coming up with good metrics that we can be um, gathering now 
that are important and measurable now. So like the example that I brought up to you last night was things like uh, the Framingham study or things like that, these really famous you know, longitudinal studies where did they, did they know that the Framingham study was going to end up being used for, to analyze social networks and social contagion of obesity in a population? No, they didn't. But it, it was useful for that. They were able to see that. They didn't, even the whole epidemic of obesity wasn't necessarily as, um, it wasn't obvious when that was started. So my point is, um, I think instead of always having a perfect, you know, endpoint design, I think we can still do a pretty good job of coming up with uh, kind of near-term things that are measurable that do a pretty good job of, of getting to more, uh, more distal outcomes, if, if that's not too much jargony language. Well, I would just like to add that, um, you know, I, if, if someone is, uh, you know, requires a cost-benefit analysis to make the decision, they're not on the leading edge of, of innovation and, and really kind of just doing what makes sense. You know, we want to design things that make sense. What I would appeal is for is, is that you measure what you have to start with the health of the folks in your building to start with, or, or some of the other programs. I mean, maybe you were talking about that earlier, and and I I think uh, Brooks, you talked about the, you know the partnership with with uh, MIT. Measure what you have to start with. That's our baseline, and so then the economists get all you know excited about. It. You know what you have, and you know what the change is, and then we can use that to to with our megaphone of of uh, benefit cost analysis for everybody else who needs that to to move forward. A quick um, statement on that, and, and Matt had up on one of his slides all the different tools that we now have to measure activity, and I've got my little Nike fuel ban on here that shows I haven't done much activity today <laughs> sitting in the audience, although standing up did help a little bit. Um, so, so I agree with you that there, we, we don't know all the things we should be measuring, and those will be revealed over time, but there are some things we clearly can measure, like physical activity, we can do pretty well at it. We have a lot of different different tools, and we know physical activity improves much of, of health and reduces chronic disease. So some things that are pretty simple to be done can be done now. One add-on to that would be the, the, the fuel band and all these different tools. There's a perfect example. Like, I think we need to make sure at this early stage that we ask the right big questions that we actually want to know, not um, immediately tying them to available data sources today, but I think we should be like, what would you actually want to know if you were just a real decision maker? Because, and then throw it out to innovators like, because Google, he, Anthony can't even tell me all the things that, he, that tools that might be available in a year that um, could solve issues that we think are insurmountable today from a surveillance standpoint. I was going to make a comment about um well, there are two comments. One is uh, metrics that we have available are just not known to traditional physicians so much. And the heart rate variability testing we use every day in my office. And I think there are no traditional physicians that measure heart rate variability on every patient. And ideally, if you knew that people who crossed your arms, crossed your legs, leaned to the side, they've got problems um, maintaining heart rate at a stable value when they stand up. So they're dilating the veins and have dysautonomia, and that's induced by VOCs in the air and has been published at Harvard in outdoor pollution. But in indoor air quality also gives us dysautonomia. So a lot of these metrics are known by, I'm just a young clinician in this field, but known by these experts that came before me. And I would say that the precautionary principle is what we talked about at the CDC brown table I was on. It has really less to do with known risks, but take the clinical information, Say we want to really use the precautionary principle and prevent what happened to people at the EPA in the building from happening again and listen to the people who get sick and the doctors who take care of them, more so than people who are naysayers on the outside saying, oh, they don't have any problems with their nervous system. Hi, my name is Lorna Rosenberg. I'm with the EPA Mid-Atlantic office out of Philadelphia, and I came down for today. I'm thrilled to be here, but I wanted to make you all aware of something exciting that happened yesterday, which is yesterday, if you're not aware, the Green Ribbon Schools were announced, which is a partnership between the EPA, the uh, Department of Education, and also the Council on Environmental Quality. 
And this year there were 78 honorees, 64 school districts, uh, 64 schools and 14 school districts that were winners, including where we are right now, Montgomery County a School District was an honoree uh, for Green Ribbon Certification. What does that mean? It means excellence in building um, operations and maintenance and design. It means excellence in health and fitness, and it also means excellence in sustainability and environmental education. Why am I telling you this? Other than the fact that you should all know, and now you do all know, so that's a good thing, and encourage the schools that you know and work with uh, and where your kids go or your grandchildren or whoever you may be connected to to apply for Green Ribbon for next year. Uh, the, other th the thing that I heard when I was working with my school's counterparts uh, at the state level is that they need, if a school makes an investment to do all this great stuff, the, the, the folks in the schools want a metric. They want some way to figure out, we've made this investment, what are we getting out of it? How can we somehow report back to our taxpayers, our stakeholders, and everybody else for enthusiastic children that are gardening and walking more and, and being in healthy, clean environments, uh, how can we give them some assessment tool to be able to uh, figure out what that is and report it back? And uh, it's critical if we want to keep folks interested in this, because otherwise they're going to say, ah, all right, that was good, but we'll move on to the next thing. So uh, I'll take your responses. One quick thing to add, and that is that American College of Sports Medicine within the last year or so um, had a conference up here in this uh, D.C. area on academic achievement and physical activity. So there's more and more research being done to show the association between those two things. It's the trickle down. Right, right. No, no, I know. But just another another metric that could be looked at in, in addition to some of the other health indicators or physical activity. Question. No. Were any of those schools in high poverty neighborhoods that we oh, received awards? Yes, of course. Many, okay. many, many. Those yes. will be interesting More models for health disparities. Good. Yes. I would just like to reiterate the Green Ribbon School program is actually a really big deal because say if we're thinking about motivating market change, um, the Department of Education, I'm very new to this realm, but it's never had health as a component of its mandate. And so by mentioning health as a specific pillar of being a Green Ribbon School, that has tremendous implications in terms of it being for a huge uh, section of, of the built environment that has really well-known big health implications for children. The, the second thing um, is just to the, our point that you just made uh, very nicely, which is that, um, again, I think what we have to do is educate folks who have to make that case all the time that they don't, what they think they want is evidence that if they change the school this way, that obesity rates will go down. But we have to kind of show, well, that's not actually possible. <laughs> uh, it's really hard, at least, in, in the short run. So focus instead on physical activity, which then, once you, if you show us physical activity, we can then supply you with evidence that gets you to academic performance and health metrics and all these other things. So it's like figuring out what those, and those are also much more measurable things. Well, even in, I had a chance to review these applications, and I can tell you from the responses uh, that I saw nationally that folks don't really, they don't really get it. They don't really get it at the school level. They don't really get the fact that disease prevention has to do with the quality of your indoor air environment or your indoor environment in general. There is not that link. It just isn't out there. So, and if these folks, these are the Green Ribbon winners, hello, so we need to really work with them to make that aware. Okay. I, I'd like to, I'd like to, Sort of go back to my, my point as well, though, that everyone is always looking for this precise dollar benefit that they can go back to the Board of Education and so on. And it reminds me of, um, well, several things. One is that they could show you know, real positive training skills, earning money if they had trained the kids to sort coal like kids used to do and you know, bring home some money. And you know, that's something that they can quantify easily. Um, I'm just kidding there. Sort of, um, but the uh, in terms of how designers and how people in facilities work, the problem comes, and this came early in the green building uh, discussion. Was uh, building managers would come to us and they would say, "Well, if I improve the air quality this much, 
uh, how many dollars per square foot would I save in this building? How much productivity would be gained? Uh, there was at the, uh, I think it was an ASTM conference, someone was talking about a standard where you could quantify by how much people made uh, on staff where you want to make the investments in your building. Because if someone makes $100,000 a year, you know, their, their productivity could be affected by 10%. That's as much as the secretary is making in the dark hole by the elevator and the copy machines. You know, but you want to put your money where, you know, you invest where, where the money is. It completely misses the whole idea of the human health baseline that everyone's entitled to. Things like physical, physical activity in schools that disappear. Uh, and I'm not saying entitled necessarily. Well, if you look at the UN, uh, you would say you're entitled to it. But I think just in terms of the, the public health policy discussions that are going on here, those are things that everyone can work into the program without having to quantify it. And I think it's important, again, to have you know, like real economists uh, who can talk about the complexity of getting to that point, because all the rest of us you know, can talk about, you know, I get 37 miles per gallon, and I'm saving $300 a year. That's not really, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Ebony Andrews, and I'm from the Office of the Surgeon General. And first, I wanted to make a comment that I'm incredibly thrilled to be here because of the information that you're presenting has extreme relevance to what we're working on in the Office of the Surgeon General. One with being the National Prevention Strategy, which be, goes beyond our office and is a federal effort that was brought on by the Affordable Care Act to really put prevention at the forefront. And one of the main aspects of that is healthy and safe communities, and that's what this is about. But secondly, with the Surgeon General's new campaign, which is on walking and walkable communities, um, it doesn't get more in depth as far as getting people to walk as far when it comes to the communities that they're, that they're living in. And with that, I wouldn't, I couldn't let the opportunity go past without informing you all that there is currently a federal registry notice out to inform a, a, an anticipated call to action on walking in walkable communities. And, and you, by that you mean there's a specific, it's a public comment period, isn't yes. that correct? Which yeah. I, I think everybody's probably gotten these emails, but we, this room should probably take five minutes before we all leave and comment, because uh, you know, if anyone has something to say, it, this room does. I'm sorry? Great. So I, I just wanted to kind of leave you with a challenge. So when I look up there, I see some great innovators. And I remember being in conferences, you know, five years ago saying, who's going to make the tool that takes us to market? Who's going to come with some weapons to say, we're up to good stuff, but how do we actually take this to market? And I was so impressed to see each one of you say, here's a tool. Here's how we've used it, and it's getting there, and we're talking the language. But I would actually challenge you, as we look at some other analogies of how we've strategized in the market, is that when you're talking about the market, you're still talking about the building scale, the owners, the developers. We're not talking about consumers who we know is critical to markets and this sort of empowerment level of the consumer. And I was thinking about direct-to-patient advertising um, on television and this sort of empowerment to say, I don't live in a healthy environment. My hospital is not a healthy environment. And we're starting to get there on that one. But trying to take the innovators because I know each one of you are at the table with the business owners um, and at the table with really interested parties and say, now that we've innovated to a tool for the high level kind of consumers, how do we start to empower all consumers so that it sort of works top down and bottom up? I, I think that's a great comment. I'm really glad you said that because I think we need the public demand for, for some of these things to happen. And the analogy I would give is smoking. You know, there was a, a, a top down, but then people said, I am not coming to this establishment if you have smoking. So I, I think that sandwich approach is really, really a good one. If, if we, we have to do some education and, and make sure people understand, but having um, the public understand the, the benefits of making these changes. And, and the one small strategy I'd give as an example that I saw, uh, maybe you saw in the news, I think it was in Raleigh, that um, someone put up gorilla signs that would say, you can walk to such and such museum or whatever in 10 minutes. You know, to drive there and find a parking space is 30 minutes. You know, just to bring that to people's attention. So, small things. Well, I would, um, it's not always, a, it's not all about walkability, uh, but um, I do think that there's a pretty interesting example of directly influencing consumer demand with something like WalkScore. 
Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but it's a, you know, and, and I've actually been thinking a lot about why is it so popular? Because I think if as academic um, physical activity researchers, and if, to be honest, the walk score itself would tell you it's not the perfect walkability index, but it, it is actually has achieved um, market value to the point where real estate agents will pay to have uh, walk scores, if they're good, um, associated with their MLS listing. So it's right front and center. Um, and, it, and it has now, their, you know, Brookings has done a big evaluation of it, and uh, CEO for cities have done literal analyses showing that you can quantify changes in mar market value uh, based on a type of measure of walkability. So is that perfect? Is that the only one? I don't know, but what I've been trying to, to your point, been trying to think about some of these metrics that have worked and have made consumers a bit more engaged and put their, and what makes those work? Um, what are the essential elements? And maybe, and then go back to the research community with a new constraint, which is the, you, if we need metrics that stay focused on market transformation, um, instead of being perfect, all, from our perspective, they need to be effective. What, I don't know if that gets to what you're trying to say. But. You got, I think we could just put Judy's picture of the two zoos up as well and just send them out mm -hmm. and be like, which one do you live in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just to start off to that campaign. Thank you so much for all your comments. Sure. I, think, I think we have time for one last question. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the business case for indoor air quality. Um, with EPA, Office of Radiation and Indoor Air, and the Energy Star program has been pretty successful. Um, you know, the, the monetizing of um, energy and the payback and so forth is known territory. Uh, the EPA Indoor Air Plus program uh, sits on top of the Energy Star program um, as a kind of certified, uh, you know, a label program um, to a builder who says, why would I take on this additional cost? What's in it for me? Uh, I'm wondering regarding the monetizing of, of uh, some of these factors, what, what you might have to say and, and data sources, if any, to uh, assist us in this challenge of, you know, why should I? What's in it for me? Um, this is Rebecca. Just uh, real quick, I guess, I'm, I'm not sure I would go down the route of monetizing because some surveys that we've done recently show that people care about health um, and they are willing to pay for it regardless of whether they get a payback. There is an essence of health that people feel very strongly about and, you um, you know, we asked them a, a range of prices, for instance, for a healthy home, and we were really shocked that, in in some ways, price was was not was inconsequential to them. Now, you're talking about builders, which are different. Um, the problem is that builders are notoriously bad salespeople. They they don't know how to sell health to a consumer. So I think it gets back to the demand part: um, is that consumers have to say what it is that they want, and then we, as the industry, need need to be able to provide the solution so that builders can quickly say, oh, I can I can provide that. Now, I think the IAP program is one of those for new construction, but we have 100 million existing homes. So what's going to be our approach for the, the, the existing the homes? Environment. Protocol, yeah. yeah. And so the marketing of that, how do we get that into the hands of consumers? Because I think trying to work through uh, the building industry would be, will be a real slow adoption process. I'll, I'll just add quickly that um, you know, and the consumers in these cases are generally uh, tenants, and the businesses who are who take out those leases. You know, we I wouldn't say that they they are necessarily seeing the strong evidence, if they are evidence based businesses, uh, to say that the productivity enhancements are going to help them justify the higher leases for you know going into a green building. There is some. I would, though, even though the evidence is out there on a variety of different buildings, some, and I think that's going to continue to grow as there are more lead buildings um, out there and there are people changing from, you know, a non-lead to a lead building. I, I, 
one of my last slides indicated that we don't yet really know what aspects of the design actually enhance the productivity if we're going to get all the way down to the spreadsheet level. There is other evidence that says, um, you know, in the, the recent market downturn, the businesses that were renting or leasing in the lead buildings had had uh, were more resilient to those to 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 the economic uh, uh, you know disaster that we had. Now, if those were the, just the businesses that were thinking more about their, their employees and their productivity and they're able to weather their, it's hard to say, but there is, there's, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of pieces of data that you can kind of put together if you're a business thinking about why you're going to move into a, a lead design or, or lead standard building. Or so, build one. pardon? Or build one. Or build one. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing that for your employees, and, and I think that if you're going to build one, then you then you probably have a, a wider mandate, and and you're you're you know much um, more interested in in uh, saying you know this kind of evidence, even if it's uh, uncertain or there's a lot of uncertainty with it, this could apply to me. But if you're a a developer, it's just a, it's probably a harder case to make because they need to sell that productivity enhancement, and. Some developers uh, get it. Some build, some property managers get it. The, the, uh, there's a great story of of, um, of the Empire State Building going through uh, some dramatic renovations that that uh, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle is, is the the manager of that. And and so there were a number of different innovations and ways of bringing down the cost, but enhancing the 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 value of that building. Um, so I mean, there's there's evidence out there. It's it's, uh, and I think there are market innovators who are going to do it because it makes sense, and because they know that there are some businesses that want to be in those buildings. I would I would add to that. I would also we're talking about the private sector, but the government is supposed to lead by example, and I think um, that this is something that we can do voluntarily. Uh, I have to say I wasn't aware of this standard that you were talking about, but. There's an executive order, actually a law that mandates Energy Star buildings uh, for federal government use, including lease buildings, uh, and getting a standard like that into uh, the way that the government goes about getting space would be, you know, a step to, to lead the way. So, All right. Thank you. I think Charles has a few words.